Again, Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 26. I hope that you can turn there yourself so that you don't just take my word for it, that you can see that what I'm saying is actually coming from the Bible. The only authority I have here comes from the word of God. And my, my hope is to take its meaning and to bring it to bear and apply it to us this morning. So if you've got it, say I've got it. You got it? If you need more time, say I need more time. Does anyone need more time to get there? No? All right. Well, let's read this. Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 26. Early in the morning, all of the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how, <clears throat> uh, how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Well, what is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. And so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. And so they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd, at that time, they had a well-known prisoner who na whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting in the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. Well, what shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead the, an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. It's the word of the Lord. The title of my message this morning is, How Do I Deal With My Guilt? How do you cope with your guilt? Perhaps you've heard it said, boys will be boys. It's just human nature. Everybody messes up sometimes. Don't act like you've never done something like that. There are many ways that we try to fix or cover up or minimize or justify or even avoid responsibility for our sin. Sin. The Bible says that sin is rejecting our creator God. Perhaps you're new to the Bible, but you're familiar perhaps with the story of Adam and Eve. Yao yeah, alluded to earlier eating the fruit that God commanded them not to eat, right? It might sound initially arbitrary. It's just fruit. It's just one tree. But at the core, Adam and Eve did what we all do. We sin. 
That is, we reject a relationship with God. We reject his rule. We reject his will and his ways. We want instead to rule ourselves, to, to live for ourselves in our own way, to be, in a sense, our own God. Scripture says that this simple reality of sin against God is the fundamental cause of all of the devastation in relationships and in the world that we see today, even death. For as we turn away from God in sin, we bring disorder into our relationship with ourselves and with one another and with the world around us. See, Scripture says you can't just sweep your guilt under the rug It stays with us that we are still responsible for the mistakes that we make. How do you feel, perhaps, when you hear a passage like this one, Ecclesiastes, the very last verse of the book? God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Everything that you or I have ever done, that we've ever thought, that we've ever said, nothing is hidden from God's sight. And so I ask again, how do you deal with your guilt? I'm not talking just about an emotional feeling we have when we feel like we let someone down. It's part of that, yes, but, but ultimately I'm talking about the guilt that comes from the source of that our alienation, our our fractured relationship with God, which God's word says leads to death. The wages of sin is death. If you separate yourself from the source of all life, of course, it will lead to death. If you're joining us this morning for the first time, or you haven't been with us for a few weeks, we're continuing our sermon series in the Gospel of Matthew. We're at the conclusion of the book now. Matthew was written about 20 or so years after the death and resurrection of Jesus by one of his disciples called Matthew, also known as Levi. And the theme of this book is the kingship of Jesus. In fact, our sermon series is called Christ's Kingdom Come. That that Jesus is the heavenly king coming to bring his, his redeeming rule to the kingdom of the world. And Matthew as a whole is structured into five main discourses or or teachings of Jesus. Almost Matthew wants to picture Jesus as a new and better Moses, like the five books of the Torah, the law. Jesus' new sort of five books that Matthew is presenting to us. His five teachings that each have a, a corresponding narrative section. And so we've come now to the, the conclusion, right? We've seen the, the, the introduction about the promised king, the announcement of the kingdom, the, the arrival of, of the kingdom with the healing and ministry, the surprising rejection of Jesus and his kingdom. And then parables about people who have different expectations, things they're, they're expecting about the kingdom, and then finally building into this clash of kingdoms, particularly against Jesus and the religious establishment. And now we're right in the heart of Matthew's conclusion that Jesus, the crucified Savior King. Our passage this morning, it's all about people trying to cope with their guilt. Did you notice as we read the the repeated emphasis on responsibility? Whose fault is this? Who's taking responsibility for this act? And as we will see, these various people have destructive ways of dealing with their guilt. And it will become clear that there is only one way to get rid of our guilt, and that is to give it to the only innocent one in this passage, the only one who can take it and remove it. And so let's look together at four destructive responses to guilt through the four main sort of characters or groups of people in this passage. So first, let's look at verses one through five, and this is Judas, and what Judas tries to do with his guilt is he tries to fix it, to fix his guilt himself. In verses one through five, it says, well, look with me at verse three, after they bind Jesus, lead him away to Pilate, sort of connecting these two passages. Verse three says that, that Judas, who had betrayed him, he saw that Jesus was condemned. Of course, Judas Iscariot was one of Jesus' disciples, 
Verse 3 calls him the, the betrayer, right? We, we saw in the previous chapter that Judas had come to an agreement, a conspiracy with the religious leaders to, to hand Jesus over to them at an opportune time. And he received 30 pieces of silver, just a, a couple months wages. He realizes once Jesus is condemned to death, that he has sinned. In verse 4, he says that. He, he comes to him. He says, the chief priest, he comes back, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Judas is remorseful. He feels very bad. He's trying to make it right. But what do the religious leaders say to him? They say, this isn't our problem. This is your problem. It's your responsibility. So in intense grief, Judas throws the silver into the temple and tragically commit suicide. I imagine if you are here this morning and you have been touched personally by someone who has attempted suicide or committed suicide, this passage must feel incredibly raw to you. And I'm sorry about that. You know, God's word says that he is the author of life, that, that our lives are not our own, that every person is made in his image. And in fact, Genesis chapter 9 commands that, that every person be treated with dignity. Nearly every mention of suicide in the Old Testament is described as, as evil or someone in sin or wickedness. And so scripture is clear that Judas's act of suicide was a sinful act. And yet, suicide is not the greatest sin. It's not the sin above all sins, as some will say. It is not an unpardonable, unforgivable sin. Still, Judas, in his desire to fix it, is not able to deal with his guilt on his own. Think of what the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He says that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Judas was wallowing in worldly sorrow. You say, what's the difference between worldly sorrow and, and godly sorrow? Well, well, Judas was sorrowful, he was remorseful, but he was not repentant. He tries to make it right. Verse 3 says he was seized with remorse. In fact, in the, the literal translation of that in verse 3, it's not seized with remorse, but actually that he, he changed his mind. You might think it sounds like repentance, except the, the verb that Matthew typically uses in his gospel for those who repent. This is a, a different word. So there's some change of mind because of the circumstances, some remorse, but it wasn't true repentance. Judas confessed his sin. He seemingly changed his mind. He returned the money. He tried to make it right. He was fixing it himself. He went to the priests. But the difference is, that Judas did not go to the Lord. You know, Matthew probably wants us to think in contrast here with the previous passage from last week of Peter. Judas is wallowing in guilt in the same way that Peter was after he denied Jesus and the, the, the previous chapter 26, the last verse says that, that Peter went outside after denying Jesus and he wept bitterly. Because we talked last week, but where Peter ends up is he ends up, he goes back to Jesus, has breakfast with Jesus, is, admits his sin, is, is forgiven. But Judas tries to fix it himself. He ultimately turns in towards himself in despair rather than trying to make it right by going to God. Friends, how often do we do the same thing when we sin? When, when we do wrong, when we, we feel sad or even despair over our guilt, when you're, you're kept up at night thinking about the wrong thing that you did, I wonder, where do you go? Do you turn inward on yourself? Do you, do you try to fix it? Do you try to, to pay it back? Do you do stuff to try to make up for it? Maybe you even try to punish yourself after your sin. Maybe it's some habitual sin or some kind of addiction and you, you feel badly and so you say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to read my Bible today or I could never go back to God because that would seem flippant or, or I'm going to skip church this Sunday because I, I just can't deal with this. I need to punish myself. 
But scripture says that when we sin, no matter who we hurt, we always hurt God most. After King David commits adultery and murder, he still prays of the Lord emphatically in Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Friends, worldly sorrow leads to death. But godly sorrow leads to repentance, brings us towards Jesus. Not to, to turn inwards and wallow and punish ourselves, but to run to Jesus and receive his forgiveness. The only way to get rid of our guilt is to go to the only innocent one who can take it and remove it. That's the first destructive response to guilt, Judas, the perils of trying to, to fix it yourself. But secondly, we see here the chief priests and the elders. In verses 6 through 10, we see what they do. They try to deal with their guilt by, by covering up, and, and particularly, they try to cover it up with their religiosity. Did you notice that? The veneer of religion, right? right? Not only do they refuse to comfort Judas and, and provide any kind of help to him, but they're only concerned with the letter of the law. Right? Look with me at verse 6. The first thing that happens, Judas throws the money in the temple, goes away and hangs himself. What do the chief priests say in verse 6? Well, it's against the law to put this in the treasury since it's blood money. So let's use it and buy something else. Let's, let's buy a field. The silver coins here are acting almost as a symbol of responsibility. And this is a, a, another chance, really a climactic way that the religious leaders, following the letter of the law, missing the heart of the law. In just a few chapters before this, Jesus gave a scathing condemnation of these religious leaders. He, he said, in chapter 23, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices! But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. You, you strain out a gnat, a bug would be unclean to eat. Yet you swallow a camel, which would also be an unclean animal. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but the inside you're full of death, uncleanness. In the same way, on the outside, you appear uh, to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And they prove it again here. They are more concerned with the money than with the murder that they are participating in. Friends, it is possible to be very religious and yet to use your religion to shield your guilt. To use your religion to keep God at arm's length. It's possible to use religious activities, good activities, to, to cover up deep areas of guilt in our lives. You know, I wonder, friends, when, when you come here and gather with the church, do you act significantly different here than when you go to work or to class or when you're out and about on Monday morning? Or do you come here to church perhaps sometimes to, to atone for your sins in some ways? Like, hey, I had a really bad weekend, and so I need to go to church kind of to, to, you know, balance the scales out a little bit. I'll throw a little bit in the offering this week. I'll sing a little bit louder. I'll pray a little bit more. Or maybe your view is the opposite, where I'm going to come to church to sort of add some coins into my spiritual bank that I can spend doing some other sin during the week. Friends, only Jesus can atone for sin. Only Jesus can remove our guilt. Religious activities, particularly empty external religious activities, cannot remove your guilt. Another implication for us to consider from the religious leaders covering up their sin with their religion is that they kept the letter of the law. Their hearts were far from God. My prayer for our church, for our community, is that we would be a community not of religiosity, not of sort of external forms, but that we would be sincere, a community of honesty, of light. First John chapter 1 says this, 
God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Walking in the light in this context does not mean perfect sinlessness. It means bringing honestly your sinfulness to bear. Bringing it into the light. For asking forgiveness of God. But do you notice here, it says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That the emphasis, the priority of each other. That we walk in the light together. There's some means of the forgiveness and purity from God that comes via your brothers and sisters in the Lord, in this community, in the church. Friends, I don't want this community to just be an empty religious community, but a gospel community. And again, you don't have to come up front. We're not going to have people come up and just, you know, confess their deepest, darkest sins in front of everybody, right? But, but if you come here and there isn't anybody you can be honest with about your sin then you are not believing in the power of the gospel. You're putting your hope in, in your own appearance and works. And friends, as a pastor, I probably struggle with this more than every other person in this room. Because I've got to stand up here and I, I try to be an example to you. And, I, and I'm growing in this. I'm trying to be vulnerable. And the, the men's discipleship group, the guys know in that group, we're, we're talking about this. I, I struggle with this to be open and honest about my sins and my failings. I want us to be a church where we can do that. And also to be a church that when a brother or a sister is caught in sin and brings it into the light, will you be there not to condemn, not to belittle, not to woe. That's not my problem. But to comfort with the gospel, to restore. You might argue rightly that Judas actually went to the right place. He went to the temple. Where the temple at that time was the place where you went to be restored. It was where they thought supposedly God was. You do a sacrifice. The priests were supposed to bring, restore people back to God through these sacrifices. And yet Judas finds dismissal. Brothers and sisters, when you join a, our community, your fellow members' problems, they are your problems. And your problems are their problems. And we bring them to Jesus together. Galatians 6, I love this. Brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. We point people to Jesus. Carry burdens. We point people to the only one, the only one who can take away our guilt. That's the second destructive response. First, Judas tries to fix it. Second, the religious leaders try to cover it up with their religion. And third, Pilate. Pilate tries to deny it. Deny his responsibility completely. This is in verses 15 to 26. The Jews, even though they've condemned Jesus to death, they have to bring the Romans in because it was illegal for Pilate, or sorry, it's illegal for the Jews to execute anybody. So they have to ask Pilate, the governor, if he would execute Jesus. But the problem is, is that Jesus, on, from the Jewish perspective, he was charged with blasphemy, with claiming to be God. But Pilate wouldn't care about that. So instead, they bring him before Pilate and say, he claims to be a king. And of course, in Rome, there was no king but Caesar. Jesus was being charged with rebellion. Pilate was the governor of Judea. He was a commander. And did you notice in this passage, we read it, that Pilate comes across as commanding no one. <laughs> he's weak. He's being commanded by, by everybody, being controlled. He's every step of the way simply just trying to avoid responsibility. And we even see, look at me in verse 24. We see the theme of, of responsibility and blood, right? Judas talked about blood money and, and the uh, uh, religious leaders. And in verse 24, Pilate said he was getting nowhere, that there was a riot and uproar was starting. And so he took water, he washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. When you tell someone that you're innocent, it means you're likely not, Right? I mean, if, if, if you watch The Office, uh, when Michael Scott <laughs> declares bankruptcy, I declare bankruptcy. 
It did about the same as Pilate washing his hands. Nothing. You can't just yell out you declare bankruptcy to declare bankruptcy. And you cannot just declare that you are innocent to be innocent. Pilate, yes, he's manipulated by the crowd, but he has his hands deep in this. He's the one who orders the execution. He's the one with all of the power, with all of the responsibility in some sense. And he doesn't just order a sentence. He orders a death sentence. And not just any death sentence, but a crucifixion. An awful, brutal sentence. I alluded to this in the beginning, but probably one of the, the biggest ways that we try to deal with our guilt in our own strength. Maybe like Judas, we try to fix it. Maybe like the religious leaders of our religion, trying to try to cover it up with some empty religion, but, but often we just try to avoid responsibility, sort of to, to, to minimize it or to blame other people. And my two boys, Carson and Clive, they are uh, a handful, and they, they fight all the time. You know, they, they're like, they're brothers, you know, they wrestle and all sorts of things. But you know, whenever I hear, you know, if I'm up in a different room or something in the house, and I hear some crash and someone crying, and I come down, and I say, Carson, what did you do? And Carson says, well, Clive, and I say, not Clive, what did you do? You know, and Clive does the same thing. So then, Clive, what did you do? Well, Carson did, not what Carson did. What did you do? What did you do? Even at a young age, that temptation to be like Adam, like Yao talked about, like Adam in the garden. It was this woman you gave to me, God. Wasn't my responsibility to blame somebody else. We cannot deal with our guilt unless we're honest about our responsibility in it. How often do we compare ourselves to others who are sinning worse? Or likely they're just sinning different than us, if we're honest. How often do we blame our circumstances on our spouse or our kids or our boss, as Yao prayed about, our coworkers? If it wasn't for my boss, I wouldn't have done that. The great British preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones said this. He said, you will never make yourself feel that you're a sinner. Because there's a mechanism in you as a result of sin that will always be defending you against every accusation that we are all on very good terms with ourselves, and we can always put up a good case for ourselves. Even if we try to make ourselves feel we're sinners, often we'll never do it. There's only one way to know that we're sinners, and that is to have some dim, glimmering conception of God. Church, whether we are active or passive, willing or unwilling, knowing or unknowing, we are sinners. We have rebelled against our creator, God. And this is why we need to read God's word and be in community with other believers. Now, not to compare ourselves so that we feel better, but that as we're, we're singing, we can see other, look around and see other brothers and sisters singing too and be spurred on. And see another brother or sister struggling with sin, but, but working towards repentance, even if they fail, if, but they keep coming back and, and working with it and be inspired and spurred on by that. So we can fight the tendency to deny or minimize or blame. But the only way to get rid of our guilt is we've got to be honest, accept accountability, so then we can give it to the only innocent one who can take it. That's the third destructive response to guilt. We try to fix it. We try to cover it up, like with religion. We try to deny it. And lastly, the crowd. The crowd, they're very honest. They are the only ones who take on explicitly the guilt. And yet, I think here they are justifying doing it. They justify it. In his effort to avoid responsibility, Pilate gives the Jewish crowd a choice. A choice between uh, prisoners to release. Jesus Barabbas. Uh, Barabbas bar means son of, and Abba, Abbas means father. So like it just means son of the father. The Gospel of Luke tells us that Barabbas was a Jewish zealot, sort of a, a, re- a rebellious group. He was in jail for trying to lead an insurrection, overthrow the Roman rule of Jerusalem, and also for murder. Murder and rebellion. 
So Barabbas was, was not a small criminal in custody over a, a certain kind of minor offense. He was a notorious murderer on death row. And yet, he was a revolutionary. He was notorious, and most scholars say that was a, a, a kind of a positive thing among the Jewish crowd, that he had stood up to Rome. The crowd had a choice between two Jesuses, between two sons of the Father, the violent one or the meek one, the, the worldly kingdom-focused and revolution or the spiritual kingdom-focused, sort of some, some macho messiah or a suffering savior. And at the urging of the religious leaders, the crowd chooses Barabbas for his notoriety and his exploits against Rome. But notice again the theme of blood and responsibility. Verse 25, again, they take it all on himself. Pilate's washing his hands. It's your responsibility. And they finally say, his blood is on us and on our children. Finally, someone takes the responsibility. Now, this verse has been used, sadly, to justify all kinds of anti-Semitism throughout church history. People who believe that this means that all Jews are condemned. That all Jews must suffer in some way. But it'd be unlikely that Matthew, a Jew himself, our Savior, Jewish himself, would ever want us to think that this was only about the Jewish people. Perhaps these thinking ahead, about 50 years from this point, A.D. 70, when there will be a revolt, the zealots will rise up, try to overthrow Rome, and Rome will crush them and destroy Jerusalem, flatten the temple. Perhaps he's thinking about that, but, but most of all, I think Matthew wants us to see ourselves. Verse 25, he uses this general term, all the people answered. The laos, all of them, in, in unison together. He wants us to see ourselves, our responsibility, whether Jew or not. Like the hymn goes that we'll sing in just a few moments. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. This crowd is us. We are the ones yelling, crucify him. We are the ones who say we reject God's rule over us. We want to be our own gods, our own way. It's interesting how the crowd, while being manipulated by the leaders, would justify their guilt, grasping for worldly power in order to free the notorious Barabbas, hoping to get the revolution they wanted. It's important for us to remember that when so many around us in our workplaces and in, in politics and business, they, they're grasping, they're grasping for power, doing whatever it takes. That Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. Yes, we are to act justly. We are to pray for our leaders as we did for our Supreme Court. But our motivation should not only be power, but love and following after our, our suffering Savior. So we shouldn't try to fix it, our guilt, like Judas. We shouldn't try to cover it up like the priests. We shouldn't try to deny it like Pilate or even justify it like the crowd. The only way to get rid of our guilt is to give it to the only innocent one who can take it and wipe it away. And so I want to close in looking at the only innocent person in this passage. You may wonder when we're going to start talking about Jesus here. <laughs> we're talking about everybody else. In the midst of everything, all the guilt to his left, to his right, surrounding him, everyone trying to avoid responsibility for the killing that they were committing, there is one innocent person, that is Jesus. Judas mentions in verse 4 that he shed innocent blood. In verse 19, Pilate's wife, in this dream that she has, look with me there, verse 19, she says, don't have anything to do with that innocent man. The original actually says that righteous man. But interestingly, notice how little Jesus says. Right, right, look back up with me in verses 1 and 2. Uh, 
how many verbs there are, and Jesus is simply the, reci- the passive recipient of all of these verbs. He's going to be executed, verse 1. They bound him. They led him away. They handed him over. And then again at the end of the passage, in verse 26, he is again handed over. I guess in uh, uh, this translation, they led him away to be crucified. Before Pilate, in verse 11, Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replies, you have said so. He gave the same response to religious leaders earlier that day, in the middle of the night. This was now the morning. Sort of in an enigmatic way to say, yes, I am. You said I'm the king of the Jews, but not not in the way that you mean it. But these are actually Jesus' last recorded words until he's on the cross praying, at least in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is, for the most part, silent. In fact, verse 14, look at me there. Jesus made no reply to all the charges, not even to a single charge, and it says that Pilate was amazed, greatly amazed. Why why would he not speak up, defend himself? See, Jesus handles the guilt differently than everybody else. Paradoxically, the only innocent one in this story is the only one who accepts the guilt truly doesn't try to fix it or deny it or defend it or justify it or cover it up. He just receives it. Jesus answers to no one in this passage because Jesus is willing to be judged by God for us. And 500 years before this, there's a prophecy about this very moment would happen. Isaiah 53 and says this, and, and then just listen. It's not going to be on the screen, but just listen to this and hear the connections 500 years before and what the passage we read here. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and he made intercession for the transgressors. That is the theological behind the scenes of what is going on. Jesus is laying down his life as an offering for sinners. We are like Jesus Barabbas. Jesus dies the death of a guilty person so that the guilty person, even the violent one, the murderer, can go free. Paul writes that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the the only innocent one, the only sinless human, he lived the, the perfect life that you and I failed to live. And he died the death for us that we deserved to die, so that all who would believe in him might be forgiven, might have all of their guilty stains washed away. And if you're here and you're, you're not a Christian, I'm so glad that you are here.
and you're pursuing God, you're, you're thinking about God, or, or perhaps there are some of the ways you deal with guilt and you realize, well, I thought I was a Christian. I, I went to church. It's been my background, but, but I'm not sure if I've got the real thing. If I truly believe in my heart, I encourage you to turn to Jesus. Jesus is the only way to remove your guilt, your stain of sin. And it's free, the invitation to come to him, simply to believe in him and his death, his resurrection. Worship him as God and Savior. You can pray even this morning. There's a prayer on the back of our bulletin that you might consider praying. And for Christians here in the room this morning, yeah, we've talked about many implications, many applications already. Encouragement is that we should be honest about our own sin with ourselves and also with our brothers and sisters. We want this to be a gospel place, not just a religious place. We want to be faithful priests, not like the religious leaders, faithful priests who point people to our high priest, Jesus, for healing. And I hope that this honesty about our own sin should cultivate in us a humility with those around us. Parents, you should be quick to apologize to your kids. Not just in modeling repentance for them, but in just being repentant yourself, being sorry, acknowledging that even though, from my own experience, even though a three-year-old is all the things wrong, it's so easy to blame the three-year-old or the five-year-old or the one-and-a-half-year-old. But there's so much sin in my own heart. I need to apologize. At work, man, you're going to be very different at work if you are ready to admit when you're wrong. You're open to that. And the reality of sin should keep us from gossip about people who sin differently. It should keep us from pride and from division. And I would say most of all, if you're here this morning and you really struggle with your past sin, with your guilt, maybe you wake up at night or sometimes you're daydreaming and you kind of look back and remember, oh, you're like, oh, so guilty. I just encourage you not to be like Judas. Don't wallow in your pain, but run to Jesus. If you are in Christ, that sin is paid for. We, we always need, church, to remember that the only way to get rid of our guilt is to run to Jesus. We can't fix it, deny it, cover it up, justify it. Let's run to Jesus. We'd run to Jesus together. I love the hymn that says this. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, might we not leave here without feeling the power of your invitation to bring all of our guilty stains to you to have them washed away. Forgive us for how often we cover up and deny and minimize and try to fix our guilt ourselves. Would you help us to trust you, trust the gospel, trust your love and your mercy to be able to come to you with even the worst of the worst and knowing that if we are in Christ, our sin can be washed away. I pray, Lord, particularly for those in the room who theologically in their head know that they are forgiven but struggle to feel that. Would you help them, Lord, to know in their heart to feel your embrace, your fellowship with them? And would this place, this community, be a place of light, and of restoration and of comfort 
and of forgiveness. As we all come to the table together, we all fall before the cross together. So we are all sinners in need of your mercy. Amen.